And I'm pleased to welcome you to this IPI Policy Forum, co-sponsored with the United Nations Civilian Capacities Project on the subject, South-South Cooperation for the Provision of Civilian Expertise in Post-Conflict Settings. We are holding this meeting here, which addresses the potential role of South-South Cooperation in supporting transitions from conflict as a sidebar to the current meeting of the General Assembly's High-Level Committee on South-South Cooperation. So I will limit my comments on the subject in favor of letting someone else speak who is far more conversant than me with it and also with that ongoing meeting. That person is Sarah Cliff on my left, who will begin our discussion with some introductory remarks. You have her full biography and those of our other speakers in your papers, so let me just briefly introduce her and the remaining speakers before turning this over uh, to Sarah. Uh, Sarah Cliff is UN Special Advisor and Assistant Secretary General for Civilian Capacities. <clears throat> she is currently on secondment from the World Bank where she was most recently the Special Representative of the 2011 World Development Report on Conflict excuse me, on conflict, security, and development. She worked for two decades in countries emerging from conflict and political transition, including Afghanistan, Burundi, the Central African Republic, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Guinea-Bissau, Ethiopia, Haiti, Indonesia, Liberia, Rwanda, Sudan, South Africa, and Timor-Leste. Zahir Tanin <clears throat> has been the permanent representative of Afghanistan to the United Nations since December 2006. And since 2008, he has served as chair of the Intergovernmental Negotiations on Security Council Reform, which were launched in February 2009 and are ongoing. I note with particular personal pleasure that he spent much of his life as a journalist starting in 1980 in Kabul and later working as an editor and senior producer for the BBC World Service. Mitra Vashist is an Indian diplomat who, upon her retirement, was the government secretary for external affairs. She was India's ambassador to Cuba, the Dominican Republic, and Haiti, and she worked in India's missions in Vienna, Thimphu, and New York. Macharia Kamau has been the permanent representative of Kenya to the United Nations since December of 2010. Prior to that, he was Kenya's permanent representative to the United Nations office in Nairobi, where he served concurrently as permanent representative to the UN Environment Program and the UN Human Settlements Program. And he has had extensive experience elsewhere in the UN system going back to 1985. So to start us off, I'd like to give the floor to Sarah Cliff. Thank you very much, Warren. It's a pleasure to be here at IPI and with a panel of such strong experiences and thinkers on the question of South-South exchanges in conflict-affected countries. This issue is central to the Civilian Capacities Initiative, and I was just going to frame a, a few remarks on why it is so central. The background to the CivCap Initiative is a piece of analysis done by a panel chaired by Jean-Marie Geheno, which Ambassador Vasikt participated in which looked at what needed to be done to create more successful support to sustain peace building and concluded that national institutions are really central to this. That for all our successes in delivering other forms of assistance through political or peacekeeping or humanitarian aid, where we do not succeed in helping to strengthen national institutions, we do not succeed in creating sustained peace. The CivCap initiative was therefore designed to focus on new approaches in building national institutions, in particular in the areas most directly linked to peace building, inclusive political processes, security, justice and rule of law, economic revitalization and jobs, and core administrative functionality. So led by Susanna Malcora, CivCap has three areas of work 
working to strengthen the dialogue with national governments on the priorities for institution building so that these are really nationally owned, working to strengthen networks of expertise with member states, NGOs, and think tanks, and working to strengthen some of the supporting UN systems, since it doesn't help us to have better sources of expertise if it takes us several months to actually get people in place to provide that assistance. In terms of networks of expertise, South-South exchanges and the priority placed on them are really central to the work that we are doing here. So CivCap had two principles that I think are something of a new departure. The first was the idea that the UN should not be trying to have all this expertise in our own staff. We should be looking at networks with other organizations and with member states to provide it. But the second is that we should particularly be putting emphasis on capacities and expertise that comes from countries which have lived through the experiences of building and transforming institutions after crisis and of working with levels of, of low capacity uh, and legacies of um, problems coming from conflict. So in that sense, what are we, we then doing at a practical level to go beyond the rhetoric of saying that South-South exchanges are important and move to putting these into practical action? One of the most important things that we have planned over the next few months is to look at the development of an online platform which describes some of the experiences available in member states and government agencies and in NGOs and think tanks in those five areas of institution building. This would enable governments and civil societies in countries that are facing transition to be able to look in one place at the different sources of experience that are available and try to set the type of assistance they receive to avoid some of the problems of approaches that are badly coordinated or duplicate or are not adapted to the national context along the lines of some of the problems that Ambassador Tannin, for instance, has written about in the past. So this is really one of our core objectives, and we hope very much that it is primarily southern experiences of this kind of institution building that are reflected in that platform. So with that, I, I hope very much that the experiences that we have on the panel today will be a very good illustration of that kind of approach in general, and also an encouragement to thinking about broadening this and to other experiences that may be of value in these circumstances. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Sarah. And now I turn to Ambassador Tanin. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to be among uh, such uh, experienced and uh, great uh, panelist, uh, my colleague uh, Ambassador Kamo, uh, former external affairs secretary of India, uh, Ambassador Vasisht and uh, Sarah Cliff, uh, and, and uh, we are happy that this this uh, debate is chaired by Christopher, who has been always. Uh, who has always brought us together with uh, many issues that is now IPI try to uh, to be in the center and help us in our work. Uh, I, uh, I think I'm among uh, uh, a number of colleagues and also I, we are dealing with an issue that has been uh, conceptualized for a long time uh, from different angles. Uh, this, uh, the idea of South-South cooperation uh, was uh, gradually developed by uh, experts better than us. Um, and then uh, in the middle we have now uh, the UN CIFCAP. And we have uh, this, uh, uh, the, the panel which uh, uh, Sara mentioned. And, uh, Ambassador Vasish was part of that, where uh, the, the UN uh, uh, civilian capacity part is, was looking, or the panel was looking into the importance of South-South cooperation or the importance of this relation of this concept with uh, 
uh, in the aftermath of the conflicts and conflict-affected countries, of which my country is an example. Uh, we welcome uh, this, uh, this initiative today, and uh, I, I think uh, what uh, uh, this, this idea of, uh, uh, of uh, UN, uh, the, the online uh, uh, initiative, uh, which uh, uh, Sara talked about, is something very important, uh, the CapMatch online platform. Uh, <clears throat> Afghanistan's uh, perspective uh, of South-South uh, cooperation has been an integral part of development of the country. Uh, uh, through that, uh, we tried to develop our civilian capacity as we rebuilt in the aftermath of a more than 30 years of decades of uh, conflict in the country. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not trying to be part of a very ex expert debate on the concepts of, of South-South cooperation and the concepts that the civilian capa capacity uh, part is dealing with. I'm trying to bring here our perspective and the experience, and I'm going to focus uh, here on one of the examples that is very important for us within the framework of South-South cooperation, that is Afghan-India relations. But before that, let me uh, share with you that uh, how, why we are so uh, focused on that concept and why it is important for us. Uh, the, the long time, to, I mean the long conflict in Afghanistan, we talk about 30 years, but it is it looks like that is more than 40, 30 years. We are still not out of the conflict, or parts of the country is not out of the conflict or, uh, or, or war. Uh, it, it led to three catastrophic uh, in our, uh, consequences for the country. The first, of course, is loss of cap human capital. Uh, the, the immig in 1980s, in 1990s, the biggest uh, refugee population of the world has been Afghans, or were Afghans. Now, I think still Afghans are one of the biggest population of the refugees of the world. Among those refugees, the Af the, we lost our experts. It was a, a, a huge uh, brain drain of Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan was not a developed country. We just, uh, we were, we, we, we considered ourselves one of, uh, I mean, we, we at, at the beginning of this century, uh, as a, not as a developing country. I mean, we were on the verge of de developing, but uh, of course, uh, talking about in the terminology of that time, 1950s, 60s, we were one of the, uh, one of the, the poorest of the third world. And now, of course, we would like to see the words in terms of developing and developed, which is a little bit different from the time we were grown up. Uh, I think most educated people left Afghanistan. They left in different times, in 1970s, in 1980s, in 1990s. They left Afghanistan for the United States, for Europe, and also Afghan, Afghan educated people uh, were spread in the region, in Russia, in former Soviet Union, in Pakistan, in Iran. Uh, and, and, uh, it, and it was, it, it was very dangerous for, for the future of the country. The second loss, I think, was a, a, a huge destruction of the country. The infrastructure of the country has been damaged by long war. Three uh, foreign invasions, uh, at least three main civil wars, uh, war lordism, and sometime war of all against all. So this, uh, this, uh, this led to the, to almost uh, 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 loss of all we built in the 20th century. Roads, clinics, schools, uh, uh, cities, I think uh, the, the post-colonial world were very similar in 1950s. 
Now we talked about these islands of, of uh, several, uh, seven five-star hotels in some places. Uh, but we were in 1950s in a very similar positions. And even at that time, when I'm, I'm considering humbly my country as a backward country, uh, most of our, uh, our neighbors were in, 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 in similar situation, in worse situation. Uh, the, the, the modern world through refrigerator or TV or radio were, were introduced in that part of the world in Asia and Africa very lately. We are talking now about a globalization 1980s and 20s, and we that there is a detachment in mind maybe uh, of some to to the reality that 1950s was so very similar to many of us, and Afghanistan was among those. So we lost that, and uh, we lost at, at at least 300 billion dollar estimated loss is about is is there, and the third one is uh, I think Afghanistan. Development was uh, because of that conflict, this perpetual con conflicts. Uh, Afghanistan development was frozen in time, and uh, we had a democracy. In Nineteen, we had the we had the economic Korea of the Cold War uh, in 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 1950s. Parts of Afghanistan were rebuilt by Russians, by Soviet Union, parts for, by Americans, Chinese were involved. Big agriculture projects started. It was the time of dams and, and road buildings and, and the whole Cold War uh, rivalry ended up in the benefit of Afghans. So it helped Af Afghanistan to, to start uh, its, uh, an, a new life. 1960s, 1970s. In 1970s, we, we we were we found ourselves af when at the end uh, to go through these wars. The wars came to us, and then through that, I think uh, Afghanistan became the last battleground of the Cold War. And that last battleground, the West was on the other side, on the side of uh, of, of supporting the, the 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 resistance against the government. So the government relied on the Soviet Union. That affected Afghanistan's meeting with the modernization. And it was a time that there was a te technological advance. So internet, computer, mobile phone, they came very late to Afghanistan. And in 2001 and two, for the first time, mo mobile phone came to the country except the Statistic Office of, of, of Afghanistan, National Statistic Office, and mm, that might have in 1980s some computers. I don't think the Afghan administration was, or, or the offices were equipped with, with computers. So we lived, uh, uh, when we looked over of some of our neighbors uh, with, with kind of uh, past pr pr prouds, then uh, we, when we looked around in Pakistan to, Pakistan to Central Asia to other countries, we saw that they are in a much better uh, uh, position and they have more access than us to the, this, this new world. So these three things uh, affected Afghanistan badly. In 2001, after the fall of the Taliban, when the international community came to Afghanistan, intervened in Afghanistan, the reconstruction of Afghanistan was a north-south uh, process. So in Tokyo in 2002, we came together with the, with, where, where the international community uh, promised or committed itself to the reconstruction of Afghanistan. It continued in 2005 and uh, 2004 uh, in Bonn, and then in 2006 in, in, in London, in 2008 in Paris. And, and uh, happily, we have uh, this Bonn conference in December uh, last, uh, last year in Germany, uh, which was supported, the whole idea, by Chicago conference uh, uh, last week, in, which was uh, security in character, but supported the idea of transformation of Afghanistan, reconstruction of Afghanistan, and support for Afghan people in, in the next decade to come. But at the same time, when we started uh, this uh, this uh, Afghanistan became a, uh, a building blocks of a globalized world, security-wise and also development-wise, and it became part of that globalization. Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the logic behind the use of resources 
within the regional uh, neighborhood uh, uh, was not uh, ignored and uh, not lost its importance in the view of everybody. Uh, for us, when we came, in, of course, uh, when you look at the last 10 years, this is the United States that is the first uh, donor, the first the country that is the, the economic, uh, political, and security burden of Afghanistan is mainly on its shoulders. The second donor uh, forces the European Union. The third one is Japan. Of the fourth one became India. But not only India, China, uh, Iran, and other neighborhoods, uh, countries from the neighborhood also became part of that reconstruction efforts together. And we moved from reconstruction to the development in uh, many areas. And it was not, and, and little by little, this south, this north-south and south-south cooperation became part of each other. Uh, it, maybe it's, it's, uh, it's something, I, I'm, as I promised, I'm not trying to, to, to touch the concepts and, and, be, and appear uh, theoretically knowledgeable. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to share with you the experience, and then it, it, would, be, it would be good to look at it. Uh, so through that, we found uh, uh, this uh, interaction between north-south, south-south cooperation. We found that if, if you limit yourself to south-south, of course, you shortchange yourself. But if you are only north-south, also you are losing, uh, losing uh, the benefit of the of, of something that is not can only can easily come from north-south cooperation. What it is? Uh, if, if in summary, I think uh, 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 I think within the concept of expertise and knowledge and resources, that is that is that is the basis of the south-south cooperation. Of, of of course, also the lessons and experience that we share. Uh, uh, it, it first, it is uh, it is the economic uh, efficiency of 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 which 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 relates first with proximity. When you work with India or Pakistan or Iran in our concept, of course, it is economic, economically different to work with with uh, a country that's far from us. Uh, secondly, it, it's the environment also. We work in the same environments. We have the same experience. I mean, the villages in India or villages in Afghanistan or Pakistan or Central Asia or Iran, they have this, 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 the sim similarity of the problems. I'm not trying to make it uh, very simple. But how to Iranians, for example, uh, using, uh, uh, I mean, using uh, the, uh, for the villages, if, if there is no source of electricity, uh, some sort of uh, equipments for heating or for uh, for uh, lightening that is cheap that is easier that is that's based on their e experience they had time to develop these things because we were in war so uh, and in and, and India also people in, 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 in their own experience found some solutions that is maybe uh, far from the solutions that we have in Europe or in America in an advanced country. So this is why that these experiences are environmentally very important for us. Uh, one of the Russian uh, uh, colleagues once told me that it's good that you are working with Americans, but don't forget that our expert can uh, work and live in a uh, remote uh, desert somewhere that uh, uh, I'm sorry that toilet paper is, for example, not available. But we can live with it, uh, right? So this is the, I mean, this is the environmental adaptability that is part of, of that South-South cooperation. And the third one, if I'm going to be kind to myself to, to go, uh, uh, the third one is cultural. It, this uh, toilet paper example is also cultural, but there is, the cultural is, uh, uh, there was a, a guy, meeting me the other day saying that if the NATO, if, if ISAF forces are going to be replaced by a Muslim peacekeeping forces, what do you think? How it, it can work for Afghanistan? I said, let's, let's have peace first, then we can keep it. Uh, so uh, by Muslim or non-Muslims. But, but when it comes to the South-South cooperation, belief, culture, tradition, understanding on the environment, proximity, uh, it matters, and also cost. Uh, for in that area, an engineer that is coming to 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 work, of course, is is less uh, uh, 
cost us less than, than of course, a, an e expert from a, an advanced country. So let's, uh, through that, we, we focused on regional cooperation. We have different forums there. One is uh, we work with SARC, the, the, the South Asian uh, organizations. We work through ECO, that's Economic Cooperation Organization. We work through RICA. Uh, uh, what is RICA, uh, Nora? Uh, it is a regional uh, cooperation organization that Pakistan, Afghanistan, Tajikistan uh, put together. And then we created Istanbul process. We have vertical uh, structures. We have this horizontal structure where it is not only economic. It is going within what this year five, uh, five uh, identifications. It is security. It is uh, capacity building. It's economic development. Uh, it is. It's also. Uh, areas like justice and the government functionality all all come here with Pakistan for example we have different sorts of cooperations with India but let me give you some examples of India uh, that can uh, can be very helpful to know how how it works India now provide us uh, first of all India in the last 10 years spent two billion dollar in Afghanistan no country it is mainly reconstruction and aid no country at the south-south level spends such a money for helping a, a neighbor. So this is, this, is a, this is a big example of south-south cooperation, in my personal view, anywhere in the world. They, if, if I give some examples, India provides 2,000 scholarships to Afghan annual, annually for schooling and training in India, including 500 Afghan civilian uh, civil servants. Uh, and Afghan, uh, India set up a, a, an agricultural university uh, to tap the potential of agriculture in Afghanistan. More than 100 Indian supported, uh, 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 but Afghan owned small developed projects are being implemented, more than 100. And, and I'm talking about the last 10 years. Five Indian medical missions, they call it IMMS, uh, uh, have been working in Kabul, in Herat, in Jalalabad, in Kandahar, in Mazar Sharif, our main provinces who are not uh, familiar with Afghanistan. Who, for those who are not familiar, I hope everybody is. And, and they are attending and dispersing medicines to 30,000 uh, per month, uh, and 30,000 patients per month, I mean. So the other example is uh, uh, the, the, the capacity building, on, especially on healthcare area, it's All India Medical Institute that's working Afghanistan very largely. We have also in 2001, uh, in November, uh, we eliminated the costume duties between two countries, uh, which is very important. And then we have uh, uh, a very interesting projects like a 70 million grant for modernization of hydropower plant in Tajikistan, which is boosting not only uh, uh, relations between Afghanistan and, and Pak India, but it's also with, with, with Tajikistan. So in two, October 2001, we, we, we elevated these relations into a strategic partnership, which is which Prime, uh, His Excellency President Karzai and His Excellency Prime Minister Singh signed it, and it is a, a new beginning. And then I, I'm, I think uh, my time is, uh, I, 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 my, I'm, I'm talk, talked a little bit more than I expected, but let me make a conclusion that this uh, Indian-Afghan example is not about me being here to, to, to admire India. We are, uh, we are in a very sensitive region. Relation between Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Iran, and also at the same time with NATO, with uh, uh, Shanghai, with all this Euro-Asia neighbors, needs a fine uh, balance. Especially relations between Pakistan, India, Afghanistan is uh, as an effect on each other. But while we are admiring Indian-Afghan relationship, it is not because we are in love for India, right? Be this, 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 what I said is an, a rare example of cooperation. That's important for any part of the world. I hope you should have in Africa and other places such good neighbors. Uh, so, but we see it between this north-south and south-south. I don't know what the concepts are here, but this, we cannot separate it practically. 
In theory, you can separate it. In theory, you can focus only on South-South. But in fact, for landlocked countries like Afghanistan, where we are landlocked, less landlocked than other landlocks. Uh, I mean, this landlocked uh, story starts from Kazakhstan, from Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, then coming to Afghanistan, until we reach the, the sea. And in and, and, and such a situation, we need each other. It is not about Afghan issue. The South-South cooperation is about, uh, about the whole region. The whole region is also strategically important. We, 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 we cannot see only the region in terms of geostrategy. We should see it in geopolitical terms, in geostrategic terms, in geopolitical terms at the same time. And through that, we should see that co cooperation. And uh, whether people here agree with me or, me or not, because I have an advantage of not answering any question and leaving now, <laughs> I, can, I can say something which can be controversial that the South-South cooperation and North-South cooperation cannot be separated. BRICS is, I don't know whether it's a South or it is, it's not. What, where you put in India, uh, Brazil, South Africa, China, and where you put Europe and, 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 and America, how this integration means, how the globalization means for us. It needs maybe for people like you and people like Sora and other colleagues to think a little bit more how to be a little bit beyond the, the jargons that is full in our websites. Uh, our websites are full of them. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador, thank you very much. And Uh, and now uh, to Mitra Vasisht, please. Thank you very much, and thank you to the organizers for uh, having me over here. <clears throat> and also my congratulations to the UN for denting this very haloed South-South high-level committee. It's not often that they give space for a side, side show like this. Having said that, I would like to briefly touch on my experience as part of the senior advisory group. The Senior Advisory Group on Post-Conflict Capacity Building focused from the very outset on how the UN could be made more responsive in post-conflict situations. And this was chaired by former USG Guenyo with great dedication and thoroughness. He brought a commitment to the process which was very impressive and I rate it from a developing country point of view. So it should send a message across to the other developing countries on the extent of dedication which was put in by the UN in this process. The question that emerged was, if UN peacekeeping could succeed, why not post-conflict peace building and capacity strengthening? After many sessions, the consensus that emerged was that national capacity had to be strengthened and those that existed before the conflict needed to be nurtured. And assistance asked for and given had to be demand driven. The UN could not and should not attempt to do everything and had to look for strong partnerships, improve inter-organizational agility and interoperability to be successful. And only these could lead to nimble responses that constituted the main need of the hour. The key to UN participation was clearly identified as the need to ensure ownership of all phases of assistance by the country of conflict, the receiving country. The advantages of South-South cooperation was discussed, especially in the context of the success of regional initiatives in Africa. The group increasingly gravitated towards the conclusion that the UN could perhaps perform the role of a catalyst in post-conflict situations to great advantage by leveraging Northern assistance with existing and possible South-South cooperation efforts. The idea of online matching of capabilities grew in this context. The implementation stage of the report is ongoing and consists of very close cooperation and discussions between the UN and the member states to clarify the parameters of such triangulation or even quadrangulation of efforts and other aspects. As regards India and Afghanistan, in keeping with the best practices approach of the UN, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly highlight the post-conflict cooperation between Afghanistan and India. Another illustration of how shared development priorities in the same region and neighborhood could allow for a more successful cooperation. 
India has been a South-South partner for the last 30 years, and the concept was not new for implementation or execution in India. And India's partnership with Afghanistan has been based only on our shared cultural heritage, and the foundation for such cooperation has always been and will be the priorities identified by Afghanistan. There has been a spurt of activities, as Ambassador mentioned, since 2001. And as requested by Afghanistan, the latest phase has focused almost entirely on capacity building and human resource development. In all areas of activity, India is happy to report that it discovered existence of local capacity, which has been tapped and very successfully retrained. Very briefly, India's pledged assistance of over $2 billion has focused on the Afghan national development strategy priorities, and more importantly, on local ownership of all assets. The principal areas covered have been education, medical sciences, health and child welfare, transport and infrastructure, telecommunications, civil aviation, agriculture, irrigation, power generation, industry, and rural development. India is building structures ranging from parliament buildings to transmission lines to public toilets. Very clearly, it has been most sustainable to focus on areas where the giving country has achieved some developmental success and which is within the same regional condition and cultural affinities. Our capacity building and human resources activities have been of particular success, especially in the areas of scholarships and complete police training programs. Cooperation has not been just with the government, and this, I think, is an important point. India has also cooperated with many of the NGOs in Afghanistan and with all development partners from the North and from the multilateral agencies that operate within Afghanistan. India has carried the triangulation initiatives of the UN forward with its close cooperation with the UNDP on several governance issues, for example. In fact, one of our diplomatic officers in the embassy is also the governance advisor to the UNDP Afghan efforts. I would like to conclude and leave more time for questions. And therefore concluding, it is very clear that many innovative processes can be brought to post-conflict capacity building situations. It is important to keep in mind, however, that the most fundamental requirement is the political will of the countries involved in making change possible. The UN cannot be and should not be made responsible for everything that goes wrong, as member states have to assume responsibility, both of their actions and of the implementation of the ideas. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. And now uh, to Macharia Kamal, the a permanent representative of Kenya to the United Nations. Thank you very much, and a good afternoon to everybody. Um, first of all, just to uh, thank um, um, Sarah for inviting us here. Thank you very much. And um, uh, as of Monday, I gave up my role as the president of the South-South Corporation uh, high-level committee process. Um, but over the last year and a half that I was uh, president of that process here in New York, I came to realize uh, in, in very special ways just how radically important uh, the whole concept of South-South cooperation has become globally. And I've also come to realize that uh, the world is changing so rapidly that many of us who are actually in the business of, uh, of uh, multilateral cooperation, development cooperation, et cetera, et cetera, constantly find ourselves behind the curve of reality of what's going on out there. Uh, the world uh, is changing in phenomenally impressive ways. I don't have to tell you this because I know you know this already, but uh, clearly, uh, countries that in my lifetime were basket cases are now among the most powerful, most resilient, uh, most uh, phenomenally transformative societies on earth. 
this has happened in our lifetimes. And some of us just haven't moved on with that reality. And I say this because one would think that the whole idea of South-South cooperation has been a very critical and fundamental and important part of what should be the solutions of that, that we face in the world would be a no-brainer. Because why wouldn't you go to the second largest economy on Earth with some of the largest uh, capabilities, both in human and in material uh, resources, to help the world pull out of post-conflict or any other difficulty that the world is facing. Why wouldn't you go to China? Why wouldn't you go to the sixth largest economy, Brazil, on Earth? It would not have been inconceivable a few years ago to go to Japan, which was the second largest economy, or to go to Britain, which was the sixth at that point, just a couple of years ago. So why would it be even vaguely uh, difficult to imagine that we would go to China or to, to Brazil or India? And I say this because what we have witnessed in our parts of the world is that this transformation has truly changed the possibilities for us as people who live in those parts of the world. And our beacons of hope have actually shifted radically because the countries that are able to bring their resources and expertise, their surplus income, and there's only very few countries these days that have surpluses, <laughs> uh, are those countries that are actually in the South for the most part. Germany, of course, is a great example of an exception. <laughs> but nonetheless, these are countries that are clearly in a position to do things that can radically change the opportunities of all our countries and help us build lasting peace, stability, and economic progress. For us in Kenya, um, we have been part of the South-South cooperation in very many ways for the last 40-some years. Difficult as it is for a lot of people to imagine we were part of the, uh, we have been part of the peace-building efforts of virtually every country that is our neighbor with the exception of Tanzania. Whether it was Uganda during the Idi Amin years, whether it was Rwanda in the height of the crisis of the genocide, Burundi with its civil war, even as far away as the DRC, whether it is our northern neighbors, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, Kenya has been a fundamental part of the, post, of the pre, during, and post-conflict process in helping those countries come back to normality. Just taking two examples that are probably more recent and more current, Sudan, with the uh, Comprehensive Peace Agreement, as you all know, Kenya hosted much of that negotiation and worked with many countries, including the United States, the UK, uh, the traditional uh, lead countries on these sort of matters to bring peace to Sudan. But clearly, a lot of that negotiation, a lot of that peace building, a lot of that bridge building between North and South happened because Kenya has a relationship of a, as the ambassador was saying, of a cultural and historical nature that allows us to be able to be a peace builder, to be able to deal with issues of post-conflict uh, challenges in ways in which a country that is much further removed from the situation culturally and historically to say nothing of the spatial distance, would itself find it very difficult to do so. So again, building civilian capacity, seeking to utilize civilian capacity should be a no-brainer. The United Nations in all its glory, and I worked for the United Nations for 25 odd years, 
have great admiration for these institutions within the United Nations. For all of that, it only has maybe 20,000 people at its disposal if you were to put all the various institutions, the UNDPs, the UNICEFs, and so on together, that can be brought to bear on the challenges that you know, countries around the world face on post-conflict uh, situations. That's simply too little, too few a capability. And then to say nothing of the resources, the financial resources. I mean, what's the collective budget of all United Nations organizations? Can they really match up to the challenges that the world is facing on issues of post-conflict post management and development? Clearly, the answer is no. And clearly, the institutions that can deliver on this, the countries that can deliver on this, are countries that are to be found where there is a surplus, both in institutional capacity, in financial capacity, as well as in human capacity. And again, I have to challenge you to recognize that the world is changing right under our feet. And that it is changing so rapidly that even institutions like the United Nations are finding themselves playing catch up with the reality on the ground. If you look at what's happening in Somalia, I was personally involved in much of the negotiation over the last four or five years at very sensitive and high levels to try to get the international community on board on Somalia. Trying to get people to snap out of it and give Somalia a chance. It took a regional entity, a regional organization, EGAD, to take the bold steps in ways in which, working with the uh, African Union, of course, to take the bold steps and to take the risks that were necessary to help Somalia build the peace so that we can now move forward. And it was only because there was a direct vested interest, that there was a direct capability in those countries surrounding Somalia and that they were willing to invest both human and military assets in transforming the opportunities for Somalia to become a peaceful state. It was only because of that that the rest of the international community said, OK, clearly, this is doable. Any of you who are watching the situation in Somalia know what's going on. In the case of my country, we have invested an incredible amount for such a poor country, and Kenya is a poor country, in not only the training of Somalis, we have over 1.2, between 1.2 and 1.5 million Somalis in Kenya, 600,000 of whom are in a refugee camp. That refugee camp has been there for over 20 years. That refugee camp has been sustained by civilian capacity from countries around Kenya, but also from countries further afield with the support of UNHCR. The world is changing so incredibly rapidly, and the burden of this change is actually falling on many of the neighboring countries to these crises, and they happen to be countries of the South. For us then, and I could go on and on with other examples, but we can always have a chat about what those examples are. I give the example, I hope that's not my phone. <laughs> Sounds like it. Is it? <laughs> I give the example of, uh, sure is. <laughs> All right, better turn that off. Uh, excuse me, everybody. I give the example of, uh, um, the, the, a few examples of some of the countries that we work in. The first area where we have found incredible opportunities in the context of South-South cooperation has been in the issue of, in, and civilian capacity, has been in the issues related to the humanitarian responses. Anybody who's been to a refugee camp 
will tell you that a lot of the people who tend to do the real dog work in those uh, refugee camps come from either the country itself or a neighboring country, simply because of costs, because of availability, because of uh, proximity, et cetera, et cetera. This is not to say that we don't get great sacrifices from people coming from much further afield. Of course we do. But the bulk, the backbone, rests on countries from the south. Secondly, in the area of disarmament, demobilization, reintegration. Clearly post-conflict challenges that we all have to deal with. Again, it is civilian capacity from southern countries that can make the greatest difference. Again, not because they're special, but because of proximity, cultural affiliation, etc. If it was in the Balkans, we would be talking about Europeans, I would hope. And in fact, when we look back, it was the Europeans that were the bulk of the people who are engaged in the Balkans and the, and the challenges that they faced in the 90s. In Asia, it would be Asians. In Africa, it's Africans. So clearly, this is this should be, again, self-evident. The other area that we tend to find ourselves dealing with after humanitarian, and the second area being disarmament and demobilization, the third area is power sharing and uh, constitutional making. Huge post-conflict challenge. In the case of Somalia, if you don't put in place a new constitution, if you don't get the countries to learn, to, the peoples of Somalia to learn how to share power, it isn't going anywhere. And a lot of that experience, a lot of that capability is being done with both North and South. But clearly, the role of neighboring countries in nudging these countries towards power sharing and constitutional making is critical. In Kenya, we had a crisis in 2008, which lasted about three weeks. It was a bad time for us. We had the United Nations, Kofi Annan and company come down. But clearly at the same time, it took the involvement of the president of Tanzania, the presidents of Uganda, and the presidents of Rwanda and, and our neighbors to engage our presidents and our, and our current prime minister to speak Turkey to them because they had to understand, to understand that these were issues that were of regional importance. And therefore they shared power and ultimately we came up with a better constitution. The same thing in Sudan, the same thing in Somalia and I could give other examples, time won't permit me. Lastly, the fourth, the fourth area is in wealth sharing and border demarcations. Again, clearly post-conflict challenges, challenge areas. In Sudan, we know what's going on. It's a post-conflict country, right? Well, one would think. But what we saw in the situation in Higlig and in Abeyi are all related to wealth sharing. It's the oil. They are all related to border demarcations. But in the context of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement, Kenya, Ethiopia, and other countries have to get in on the game, South Africa with uh, President Thabo Mbeki, to try to bring this country, the two Sudans, to a peaceful resolution of the challenges that they face. Again, clearly, these countries use their civilian capabilities in very deep ways and in very high levels of expertise to achieve this. So I'll conclude just by saying that the challenges that we face are deep. They're complex, but they're, all, but they're also culturally and historically bound. And therefore, the cultural and historical aspects of re the resolution of these problems is best understood by those who do understand the cultural and historical complexities of these problems. And these tend to be neighbors, as my ambassador said before me, Ambassador Tannin. Clearly, 
where there's a country with the ability to, to, to expend $2 billion in helping the country rise from the ashes of conflict, as India has had done with uh, Afghanistan, well, that's excellent. But sometimes it's not about money. In fact, many times it's not about money. It's about the historical and cultural connection. And if you look at the reality of the last 60 years and the inability of our world to resolve many of its complex problems, it has, because, it has been because this dimension of the resolution of the challenges that we face on Earth has been lost on many of the peace negotiations and many of the cultural, I mean, of the, um, uh, the post-conflict uh, attempts to resolve problems. North-South, East-West, South-South, North-North. Everything is relevant. The difference now is that none is more important than the other. All are equally important because we live in a globalized world. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Ambassador, thank you very much. Uh, I want to say when you first began and you said um, the image you had was basket case to powerful country, um, I wrote Brazil here, and then in the next paragraph you mentioned Brazil. Why did I write Brazil? I lived in Brazil from 1979 to 1984 when it was a basket case. Um, uh, I love living in Brazil. As a matter of fact, I married it. Uh, my children are born there. Uh, uh, and, um, and I mention it to you now just in the context. The list you gave at the very end of South, South, North, North, um, uh, north, south. Uh, I have a, a fifth one, which is south, north, and it happened in the final, <laughs> in the following way. Um, the Brazil I lived in was famously the country of the future and always would be. It was a phrase that people used, and Brazilians hated it. But uh, it was always this country of great promise that never realized the promise. Of course, we all know now. Boy, has it realized the promise, and. Um, the conversation that led me to, to make a comment saying I have an example of South North, uh, about a month ago I got a phone call from a very good friend of mine in Sao Paulo who had been an ambassador, a very high ranking Brazilian ambassador, um, and, uh, and he is back in Sao Paulo now, and he called me to say, you can't imagine how bemused we were um, in Brasilia to get feelers from the European Union as to whether Brazil could possibly help bail out some European economies. If that isn't South North, I don't know what is. And for somebody who lived there 30 years ago, simply unbelievable. I mean, just to underline your comment about how one could have never anticipated how rapidly it happened, and in the case of Brazil, how absolutely totally it happened, and also the attitude of Brazilians about their own country has been utterly transformed in the expectable way, and that's also another a source of power in this argument. Um, uh, Anyhow, I would love to get some comment and questions from the floor. We've had some wonderful examples here, I think, uh, thrown out to us by the various people who have spoken. So if you would uh, raise your hand, I will call on you and ask you simply to wait for the uh, microphone to arrive. I must have a hand here. Um, very good. Maureen Quinn. Hi, Maureen Quinn from IPI. I, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about the South-South cooperation in the DDR area. You mentioned that, and that can be an area where there's a lot of um, political overtones or cons concerns. And so maybe if you could just expand that a little bit, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Um, the whole nature of uh, the uh, post-conflict challenge is political by definition. Um, it would be absolutely impossible to talk about a post-conflict uh, resolution that is not inherently political. The question is, who is in the best position 
to overcome the political challenges in a way in which the country can quickly move on to stability and normalcy. My proposition to you is that whilst many times it takes a neighbor from very far, uh, sorry, a friend from very far away to come to help bring peace when the conflict is regional, when the conflict is national, it usually takes a neighbor from very close by uh, to help the country understand itself a little better. I say this because a lot of times when the, when the conflict is regional, all the neighbors are tainted by that conflict and therefore may be in a very difficult position, uh, humanly speaking, to be able to be impartial. But the reality is that most of the challenges that we see are actually national, they're civil, they're internal to the country. Yes, occasionally we see a country that is uh, that is at war with another country. But even there, it's usually two countries. Maybe there's a third one that's kind of a spoiler. But that still leaves a few other countries in the neighborhood that truly understand the historical, political, and cultural challenges that have been faced, and that can speak to them a lot, probably a lot better than someone from very far away. I think there used to be a time when, uh, in our lifetime, again, Mm -hmm. When, uh, you know, we, we, we used to assume that there was someone with a reservoir of intelligence and wisdom sitting somewhere who will be dispatched uh, to pronounce themselves in a situation and therefore resolve all the challenges. I think, qu quite honestly, the world has changed in very complex ways. That scenario just doesn't cut it anymore. It takes a bringing together of a number of people with clear diff clearly different historical uh, and cultural capabilities to help resolve the kind of challenges that we are facing on Earth today. Even a superpower, a penultimate superpower, finds it very difficult to go it alone anymore. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's, mm -hmm. that's what I had in mind. Sorry to continue with it, but a little bit more about when you when you do have some of those cultural and regional overlays. Um, if you could just be a little bit more specific in the security DDR area of, of how it works. Um, Are you looking for the mechanics of uh, no, disarmament? No, the, um, no I'm, I'm looking more for, uh, like, when you have that, some, sometimes there's the overlay of the ethnic... Um, Mm -hmm. Problems and just if you could, th if there's an example of a good example of regional DDR cooperation that you like talking about that Kenya has been involved in. Oh well, I mean uh, clearly Somalia <laughs> presents itself as a screaming example. Um, uh, this is a country where the uh, the although actually actually it's actually a bad example because Somalia is actually one people. Uh, they don't have uh, vast ethnic differences. Kenya is a country where the ethnic cultural differences are stark in ways in which I don't think Western people understand. Many people see Kenyans as Kenyans. They say, oh, he's a Kenyan. We Kenyans see each other quite distinctly because remember the whole idea is, uh, is a concept of... Uh, some Europeans, the whole idea of Kenya. <laughs> it's not a Kenyan concept. It's a bringing together of peoples. When the borders were put in place in the 1920s, in our case, the final borders that we, are, that we, that we recognize today, uh, that's not a very, very long time ago. My dad was born in 1923, still kicking around. And uh, Clearly, in his, in, in his father's lifetime, uh, Kenya and what they perceived to be the, their home and their land was something completely and utterly different to what we see today. So in that context, resolving conflict in a country like Kenya is tricky because uh, what is perceived to be a national ethos in a country like Norway 
uh, is distinctly different to what it is in a country like Kenya. Because they're in the country, I hope I'm picking the right example, so if there's any uh, Northern Europeans here, please correct me. But um, where there is, uh, I mean, apart from the Northern part of Norway, obviously, but uh, the bulk of the country is one people, one language, one history, and much of their conflict has been driven uh, by them trying to define themselves as such. Well, if we were to take that example and that kind of definition of ethnicity, then in Kenya it would fall apart because we would have about 40-some different entities that could form what is in fact the cultural definition of Norway today. So when you're talking about disarmament, when you're talking about uh, the whole idea of, of, of bringing peace to a country, the complexity of dealing with those historical, and they are historical, cultural, religious perceptions of self in those countries are things that one has to overcome. And they are complex and they're very difficult. And for a lot of people, they're lost. The further away you are from the scene of that event, the more likely you, it will be lost on you. So you may come in and say, well, why aren't you Kenyans getting along? Well, you know. <laughs> Maybe they're not Kenyans. An example I was thinking of when you were talking about Kenya in 2008 was the Cote d'Ivoire in 2011, right. where the international community, the UN, all outsiders really had no, um, were very ineffective in trying to bring resolution to that electoral dispute, post-election dispute, and it was the president's of at least three West African countries, and it was ECOWAS that went in there and basically succeeded in bringing around the right resolution. I think that's a wonderful example of how people only from the region could have brought a solution to a situation that outsiders really had no power over. Um, do I have any more? Uh, Udo, are you? Was that a raised hand? <laughs> I hope so. I can always help out. Thank you very much uh, to all panelists and especially to the two of the distinguished panelists who drew attention to the displacement phenomenon uh, as stark as it is in both Kenya or in, in Afghanistan. I think it's perhaps a truism that refugees originate from a country and they are hosted by another country, usually the neighboring country, and hence again an emphasis for regional initiatives and regional solutions that will ultimately drive it. 70% of the world's refugees today are in the developing world, even though the North cries out the loudest about it. Uh, yet uh, the resources that countries, especially emerging themselves from conflict, can bear to bring on the equation is, of course, very limited, and therefore the help is still hopefully needed and appreciated. In terms of the CIFCAP uh, discussion that we are having here, uh, I believe there is no humanitarian solution to a humanitarian problem, is the refrain. Hence, the gap between the humanitarian assistance and development assistance, ultimately through the creation of capacities, is the only way forward. I think we know that. So I would very much appreciate if you could perhaps comment on what used to be called in the previous uh, uh, triannual um, development uh, program, the continuum from relief to development, whether that premise still holds today, or whether we have to really begin to think a little bit out of the box in light of the changing realities that we have seen, mm -hmm. and see whether there are some other tools in the kitty that we should be able to muster to perhaps Sarah or Ambassador Kamo. Thank you. I've asked Sarah, but also if you'd like to speak to that. Yeah, I, I think this is absolutely true, that the answer in the end to the humanitarian problem is through strengthening national institutions rather than actually through humanitarian action, which is critical to save lives but doesn't provide the, the longer-term answer. In terms of the, the continuum and what would our, our thinking now address what used to be known as the famous gap between relief and development. I actually think it's related also to some of the examples that were given earlier. So I think we are seeing now a shift that relies less on the import of assistance, both goods and people, to address prolonged crises, and much more on supporting local capacities in two ways. First, by working through local community structures in some of the ways that Ambassador Kamau 
described in terms of refugees or Mitra and Ambassador Tanen in terms of the programs within Afghanistan. Second, by looking at local purchasers. So more and more we are looking at how do you support in prolonged crises in a way that actually supports local markets and livelihoods rather than undermines them. I actually think there have been very good examples of WFP and others of the humanitarian agencies shifting in that direction, but it's supported also by more drawing on this regional approach. I just wanted to, to add a word, if I may, on some of the points that were made about the links between north-south and south-south expertise, that I actually think this is critical, not to think that we are talking now about one or the other, but that what we are talking about is a shift in the equality of the partnership. So from a situation where perhaps the assumption was that the majority of assistance, whether financial or technical, was going to come in from northern yes, sources, same. to a situation where there will be a combining of those experiences in a much more equal partnership. I think that will also affect not just the balance of technical and financial assistance, but also ways of thinking. So I think it will mean that what perhaps was seen for a couple of, of decades as being a rather rigid development model starts to draw on much more diverse experiences. And that in itself, I think, is going to be transformative in the way that the ambassador outlined in the first section. I also think that the point about uh, South North was very well taken, that what we are increasingly seeing is common challenges, where, whether of communities that have divisions between them in the UK and France, not only in Africa or in Asia, whether of challenges of organized crime and this type of threat, that are actually going to mean an exchange which is not to do with donors and recipients, but to do with countries addressing problems and challenges that they have seen in common. You want to speak? I have another question. But yeah, I, very briefly, I think uh, in the days of the continuum, uh, what we see now is a paradigm change from those days. Those days I do remember still as a delegate here in New York, and I'm not proud of the fact that I was part of the Indian delegation which thoroughly opposed the participation of NGOs on a particular issue. So we've moved very far from that area. And those were the times when we talked of traditional northern donors, separate uh, salary scales for UN from Western countries and local employees. And those were the days when we looked left, right, and center for the United Nations people to bash. This is not the same uh, area. This is not the same time and space that we're looking at right now. And right now, the continuum doesn't exist anymore because I think we have to parallelly look at when there is conflict and there is UN peacekeeping. One has to parallelly address the issues of what follows. And uh, maybe I uh, agree with you partially on the, uh, the processes being totally political thereafter. But I think these days uh, the, uh, the leadership is very enlightened and it sort of does not distinguish between what is political and what is development. The interlinkages are very clear. So we've come a long way from the days that you mentioned and we were, were sitting outside the fifth committee waiting for what post was approved <coughs> and otherwise. Right now it is a change. And like he said, that globalization has also included the need for extra resources and the need for such resources also to come from all the southern countries. And in practice, this has been proved by it need not be in terms of money. Southern countries do not have cash to offer. It can be in terms of expertise. And earlier, the notions of experts coming in from the north is now stand, it stands completely demolished, because I think local expertise coming from the region are more sought after, with the additional uh, cutting edge uh, technical expertise that has to come in from the north. So we sh we're not rooting out one or the other, or uh, weeding out one or the other. We have to work in concert. And the group that I worked with concentrated completely and totally on partnerships. There have to be imaginative partnerships to go ahead. And development is part of the political process, but politics is also part of the development process. Very helpful. Thank you. I have a question on the aisle here. Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, first of all, I would like to join others actually in thanking all the distinguished panelists for their uh, very um, eminent um, and enlightening, especially coming from, I mean, hearing all these uh, best practices of South-South cooperation already existing uh, with cases such as um, 
uh, Kenya and Somalia and then India and Afghanistan. Uh, we applaud that. And I think this is pre precisely the essence of uh, um, the, um, the issue of civilian capacity and <coughs> how to strengthen partnerships uh, with external actors. And uh, in, in this regard, Indonesia is uh, very much of a keen supporter of this issue uh, of civilian capacity and how we can actually really strengthen the partnership, uh, the existing South-South cooperation and triangular cooperation. Uh, this is actually really the, in the, uh, lies in the heart of the uh, issue of civilian capacity. I would like to know probably more on an elaborative, uh, maybe not really technical, but in the sense of uh, we, um, the CIFCAP team and uh, you know, I, in, in, in running up to the uh, um, formulation uh, development of a report of the Secretary General, the forthcoming Secretary General report um, on the basis of the Gueno report and the first uh, initial report of the Secretary General and that some consultations have been undergoing with regards to this issue. And then you mentioned, uh, SG Sarkov mentioned about the online platform and how would the online platform actually will showcase more of this existing South-South cooperation as well as triangular cooperation. And especially we have many good examples. Uh, that's number one. And number two, maybe on the issue of uh, the advantage of South-South cooperation is um, among others, the proximity I mean, proximity and indeed the closeness of relig um, cultural context and so forth. And that the Secretary General report and the Guinea report mentioned about the importance of co physical co-location of expertise. But at the same time also countries maybe, you know, when you talk about conflict and post-conflict situation in the African context, of course the best way to have it frame will be probably South-South cooperation within the neighboring countries. But at the same time, also many South, Southern countries would also like to help out. But in terms of proximity, maybe it's not possible to co-locate all of them. So how would you see this whole issue of CFCAP and co physical co-location as well as the mobilize, uh, mobilizing Southern capacities through different regions can also be um, further looked at and uh, in, in in, in this efforts of uh, civilian capacity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see no further hands, so I'm gonna ask the panelists, uh, departing from that comment, that question, and anything else, to uh, just each speak now, knowing that th these are your last words. So, uh, Ambassador Kamau, I'll begin with you, and we'll come here and we'll give uh, Sarah, who had the first word, we'll give her the last word. Do you have anything more you want to say? That's Not really. Um, I, I thought I pretty much exhausted what I had to say. Um, only to say that I think it's it, it clearly, um, um, I meant what I said with my last words, that we're in a globalized world. Mm -hmm. And therefore that uh, when we talk about civilian capacity, we are talking about all capacities on Earth coming together to resolve the challenges that we face on Earth recognizing that those with cultural affinities, proximity, uh, historical, uh, uh, deeper histor historical relations of each other uh, have a better chance of dealing with issues of post-conflict re resolution than those from further afield. And secondly, recognizing that uh, civilian capacity must not turn into a buzzword for uh, or a, a, a capability for giving um, increased access to people from further afield, whether it's the North, East, or West, uh, access to opportunities that are actually existing closer afield that should, have, that should be given to the people who are right there, who need to be, to be given those opportunities to bring their expertise to bear on the challenges that we face uh, in the various conflict and post-conflict countries around the world. That's really all I wanted to say, and to thank you very much for listening to me. Uh, maybe just one comment to say that uh, the experience of Africa has spurred on the need to look more closely at South South, South cooperation. And I think it's really the continent of Africa that's made us realize that there are successful examples coming from outside of the United Nations and multilateral agencies. So we are very grateful for the experiences that you've outlined. Thank you. Thank you. 
focusing just on, on the last question, first I'd like to acknowledge very strongly the role that Indonesia and Canada have played in CIVCAF in co-leading our consultative group, which has really over the last period been one of the ways that we have managed to stay in close contact with member states in developing the initiative. I think the point that was raised about the difference between neighboring cooperation and cooperation from more distant countries is an important one because we talked a lot on the panel today of the advantages of assistance from the immediate region and the neighborhood. I think those advantages are very strong as the examples that we looked at today showed, but there are also examples of very effective cooperation from more distant locations. Uh, in fact, within Afghanistan, the largest national program delivering results at a community level is actually a program called the National Solidarity Project, which was based on a program developed in Indonesia, even though then adapted very much to the, the Afghan context. Uh, I think that because we are living in a more globalized world, it's important to see that there are models and approaches that have been used in different parts of the world that will be interesting often for countries in transition to look at. And they may very often want to see what have been the experiences of their most immediate neighbors, but also what have been the experiences of some countries that are, are further afield to look at what they want to, to draw on and adapt. Diana also asked uh, in more practical terms, how would the online platform really help to consolidate and strengthen the, the South-South experiences that we've been describing? So this, for once, is in fact a very practical and I hope quite a simple process. There is a, a process of registration in the online platform which is open to member state agencies and NGOs and think tanks, which is essentially a short and simple description of the experiences that are available in the, the organization. Those may be experiences domestically, or they may be experiences that have already been shared with other countries or provided abroad. Very often they're a mixture of both. Organizations have to look also at who is their contact point to respond to requests and how are they going to organize responses to requests. So that of course requires some internal discussion to look at how to specify that. But that's a fairly simple process. Our team is open at any time to discuss with member states and with other organizations who are interested in registering. We're looking over the next couple of months at making sure that we have some very good starting capacities in the system. And we are making sure that there is a particular emphasis on experience from countries that have gone through this kind of process in reality on the ground. The system obviously will be a living entity. It will grow over time. It will be updated. But that's our, our target for the next period. And I'm, I'm very glad that this panel today was an opportunity to illustrate some of the types of experiences that we want to draw together within that system. Yeah, as am I. That was a wonderful, rich view of a newly globalized world and some of the challenges in it. So uh, thank the panelists. In particular, thank you very much for your attention and interest.